Good evening. This evening we are going to discuss a very interesting book, Tagore and Gandhi, Walking Alone, Walking Together. To discuss this book, we are joined by a very distinguished panel of speakers. We have with us Mr. Tushar Gandhi, President of Lok Seva Trust and Director of Gandhi Research Foundation. Dr. Ravindra Kumar, former Vice Chancellor of Chaudhary Terence Singh University, Meerut. We have with us the author, a well-known historian, Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee, and Professor Sanjukta Das Gupta, who is going to moderate the session. It is indeed my privilege to introduce the moderator of the session and then request her to take the session forward. Dr. Sanjukta Das Gupta is a professor and former head department of English and former dean, Faculty of Arts, Calcutta University. She has been the recipient of the Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellowship and Fulbright Scholar in Residence Grant, Australia India Council Fellowship, Gender Studies Fellowship Grant, University of British Columbia, among others. Professor Das Gupta has been invited to participate in conferences and has taught and lectured at universities in the USA, UK, Europe, Canada, and Australia. She is the President Executive Council of the Indian Poetry and Performance Library, Kolkata. She is the convener of the English Language Board of Sahitya Academy and member of its General Council. She received the IWSFF Women Achievers Award, Kolkata, in 2019 and WEI Kamala Das Poetry Award in 2020. Professor Das Gupta is a critic, poet, short story writer, and translator, and she has over 21 books published so far. That includes books on Tagore, such as Radical Rabindranath, Nation, Family, and Gender in Tagore's Fiction and Films, published by Orient Black Swan in 2013, Tagore, at Home in the World, published by Sage in 2013. Tagore's patriotic songs, which she has translated from Vishwabharti, publication division 2013, and in memoriam, English translation of Tagore's poems in Swaran and Palataka, published by Sahiti Academy 2020. With this brief introduction, I request Dr. Sanjukta Das Gupta to take the proceedings of this discussion forward. Over to you. Professor Das Gupta. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Usha Munshi and the India International Center for inviting me uh, to play a double role as a panelist and moderator of this very prestigious book discussion event. And uh, as suggested by Usha, I would like to request all the panelists to display the book by holding it up for the audience who have joined us on this platform this evening. If you could just do that, holding it up. If you have the copy of your book ready, as I'm holding it. Uh, I hope the author is also holding it up. I cannot see him right now. Yes, everyone is. That formal inauguration of the book, which we will discuss today, I want to once again uh, wish a very good evening to all of those who have joined this discussion, uh, which will focus on eminent historian Rudrangshu Mukherjee's new book. Tagore and Gandhi, Walking Alone, Walking Together. This book tracks the journey of two iconic figures of colonial India who addressed each other as Gurudev and Mahatma. The friendship between the poet and political activist had been a difficult friendship, but could also be interpreted as a lover's quarrel without trivializing their often strained relationship of around 25 years. 
In the book, Radical Rabindranath, Nation, Family and Gender, which was published in 2013, which I co-authored with two of my friends, in one of the chapters, I had cited Jawaharlal Nehru's insightful comparison between the roles of Tagore and Gandhi as outstanding architects of modern India. Nehru had observed, and I quote, Tagore and Gandhi have undoubtedly been the two outstanding and dominating figures of India in this first half of the 20th century. It is instructive to compare and contrast them. No two persons could be so different from one another in their makeup or temperaments. Tagore, the aristocratic artist turned Democrat with proletarian sympathies, represented essentially the cultural tradition of India. And yet Tagore was primarily the man of thought, Gandhi of concentrated and ceaseless activity. They seem to present different but harmonious aspects of India and to complement each uh, other. Nehru's comparative observations about these two timeless icons of modern India perhaps decodes the subtitle of Rudrangshu Mukherjee's new book, Tagore and Gandhi, Walking Alone, Walking Together. Interestingly, Nehru had also remarked, contrary to the usual course of development, he said, Tagore, as Tagore grew older, he became more and more radical in his outlook and views. And so expectedly, in a letter to his friend and English biographer, Edward Thompson, Tagore had written in, a, uh, in that letter on the, uh, uh, yeah, the date for that letter is 27th October 1937, when he said, do you know that I have often felt that if we were not Hindus in the wide sense of Hinduism, which included Buddhism as well, I should like my people to be Christians. And then Tagore had written also several long letters to Gandhi about their different roots, though their ultimate goals were not dissimilar. This has been uh, referred to in a great extent in uh, um, Professor Mukherjee's book. In one of these letters, Tagore had written, I say again and again that I am a poet, that I am not a fighter by nature. I would give everything to be one with my surroundings. I love my fellow beings and I prize their love. What irony of fate is this that I should be preaching cooperation of cultures between East and West on this side of the sea, just at the moment when the doctrine of non-cooperation is preached on the other side. Unquote. Remarkably at times, therefore, it seemed Gandhi some was much more radical than Tagore could ever be. When Gandhi visited Shantiniketan, he inspired the students and teachers in self-help and self-service. He had persuaded the teachers and students to run their own kitchen and sack the Brahmin cooks who, he said, combined orthodoxy and uncleanliness in a concentrated mixture. Rudrangshu Mukherjee has included details of this visit in his book, Tagore and Gandhi. In fact, caste and gender politics have often been addressed by both Tagore and Gandhi in no uncertain terms. Tagore's novel, Gora, has been cited by Mukherjee in some detail, foregrounding the conclusion that celebrates the transcendence from Hindu fundamentalism and caste prejudices. Quite remarkably also, gender politics and gender injustice are also addressed directly in Gora, as in the conversation between Gora and Binoy about women's roles and responsibilities. We find Binoy saying, look, Gora, I want to say something. I think there is a serious lack in our patriotism. We only see half of Bharat Varsha. Why do you say that? Gora asks. And Binoy says, we see Bharat Varsha only as a land of men. We don't see women at all. If we could view our nation's women outside our domestic needs, we could perceive our nation in its beauty and wholeness. And much later again in 1934 in Tagore's novel, Char Odhai, four chapters, Tagore makes this statement. They are perpetual infants 
who can only whimper and call their country mother. The nation is not a mother to such senile infants. The nation is Ardha Narishwar, to be realized in the union of man and woman. Gandhi stated unequivocally in several issues of his newspaper, Harijan, that caste has nothing to do with religion. It is a custom whose origin I do, know, do not know and do not need to know for the satisfaction of my spiritual hunger. But I do know that it is harmful both to spiritual and national growth. Tagore had also contributed several poems for publication in Gandhi's weekly news newspaper, Harijan, critiquing untouchability and social ostracism. Also, it is around this time that Tagore wrote his outstanding dance drama, Chandalika, The Untouchable Girl. Also, as reported in the Harijan, we find Gandhi's views much more radical than Tagore's about gender too. Gandhi had stated, it is certainly desirable that caste Hindu girls should select Harijan husbands. If I had my way, I would persuade all caste Hindu girls coming under my influence to select Harijan husbands. Every mixed marriage will tend in varying degrees to remove the stigma attached to such marriages. Finally, there will be, there will be one caste known by the beautiful named Bhangi, that is to say, the reformer and remover of all dirt. And finally, in a speech in June 1947, a few months before the independence of India, Gandhi is reported to having said, if I have my way, the president of the Indian Republic will be a, will be a chaste and brave Bhangi girl. If such a girl of my dreams become president, I shall be her servant and I shall not expect from the government even my upkeep. Of course, this is a bit of a digression for the gender question is not the focus of Rudrangshu Mukherjee's book. As I conclude these initial remarks, I would like to say that I feel the difficult friendship between Tagore and Gandhi may intrigue researchers and public intellectuals, but the poet and the political activists' deep bonding and ability to love, to love and laugh out loud, LOL, as the millennials now say on the social media, is absolutely unparalleled. So on Tagore's 81st birthday in 1941, Gandhi had sent Tagore a telegram that stated, Gurudev, four score not enough. May you finish five. Love, Gandhi. Tagore's telegram in response stated, Mahatma, thanks for the message, but four score is impertinence, five score intolerable. Rabindranath. Tagore died a few months later. Thank you. And now it's time to hear the distinguished author of the book, Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee, who incidentally has several books to his credit where he has paired and compared iconic figures of India, critiquing the sameness and differences with meticulous attention. Also, Rudrangshu's translations of Tagore's writing prove beyond doubt that he is a very skilled translator. I will now uh, introduce Rudrangshu, who really needs no introduction, but as this is a required formality, I will now introduce the author of the book. Rudrangshu Mukherjee is the Chancellor and Professor of History at Oshoka University, of which he was also the founding Vice Chancellor. He studied history as an undergraduate at Presidency College, Calcutta, and completed his MA in history from Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. He went up as an INLAC scholar to St. Edmund Hall, Oxford, and was awarded a DPhil in modern history by the University of Oxford. He was reader in the history department of Calcutta University. He has held visiting appointments at Princeton University, Manchester University, the University of California, Santa Cruz. He was also the editor, Editorial Pages, The Telegraph. He has written five books on the revolt of 1857, of which the most 
notable as Ard in Revolt, a study of popular resistance. A sixth, a Begum and a Rani, Hazrat Mahal and Lakshmi Bai in the 1857 uprising is forthcoming in 2021. His last three books are Nehru and Bose, Parallel Lives, Twilight Falls on Liberalism, and Jawaharlal Nehru, a short introduction. I take great pleasure in inviting Rudramshu Mukherjee, my batchmate of the 70s, to share with us his views about his book, Tagore and Gandhi, Walking Alone, Walking Together. Thank you, Shongjukta. Uh, you left the most important part of the introduction to the very last that uh, we were actually classmates and friends in presidency. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we still are. So yeah. far, you are concerned that's the most important introduction yeah. rather than all my quote unquote accomplishments. Uh, so, uh, as all of you know, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, I will refer to him as Rabindranath. That's customary uh, for most Bengalis to refer to him as Rabindranath and not as Tagore, as the rest of India and the West call him. Rabindranath and Mohandas Karanchand Gandhi were near contemporaries. They were both born in the same decade in the 1860s. Uh, Gandhi a little younger than Rabindranath, but they didn't meet. Uh, personally, one-to-one, -one, till uh, the 6th of March, 1915, uh, when Tagore visited Shantini Ketan, Rabindranath visited Shantini Ketan for the second time. On his first visit, Gandhi actually wasn't present, uh, Rabindranath wasn't actually present in Shantini Ketan. Second time Gandhi came, Rabindranath was there to meet him and talk to him. But as the date itself shows, 1915, by that time, both of them were fully developed individuals with very formed but evolving views on various aspects of the world. And they were also in their respective spheres of activity famous, very, very well known. Rabindranath had received the Nobel Prize by 1913. He was beyond dispute the leading literary figure in Bengal. Gandhi in South Africa, by launching a unique form of protest called Satyagraha, uh, had made himself famous and as the advocate and champion of against rather racial discrimination against Indians in South Africa. In 1915, Gandhi returned uh, from South Africa, he uprooted his stumps in South Africa completely and returned with his family and the children who were studying in Phoenix Farm, uh, the farm that Gandhi had established in South Africa, and he came back to India. And the occasion of the visit to Shantini Ketan was the fact that uh, the children of the Phoenix Farm came to Shantini Ketan and lived in Shantini Ketan initially for a few months. So they were famous and also very importantly, they knew about each other's work. And this knowledge was mediated by a common friend uh, who is also an important figure in my book, uh, Charles Frere Andrews, who in India is famous as Dinamundu Andrews. Uh, Andrews actually brought the two of them together, uh, told each of them of the other's work and it was at Andrew's suggestion that the Phoenix Farm boys and girls came to Shantini Ketan. Uh, but before they met, just after the Phoenix Farm boys and girls had arrived in Shantini Ketan, Rabindranath wrote a letter to Gandhi. The Letter is dated January 1915. And in that letter, in the last line of that letter, Rabindranath writes that this, these children will form a living bond for the shadhana of each of our lives. 
So the, I'd like to draw attention to that word shadhana that Rabindranath uses. He doesn't use any English equivalent and the word shadhana is, is a very difficult word to translate into the English language. He uses the word shadhana and so he's recognizing in fact that in different ways both he and Gandhi are engaged in a similar kind of quest that requires shadhana, that requires this dedicated endeavor uh, to pursue that quest. So in the very first letter that we have between the two of them, there is this glimmering of a recognition of commonality. This was the first of many letters, telegrams that they exchanged, and also the first of a series of articles that, that they would write, sometimes complementing each other's views, sometimes dissenting from each other's views as well on various issues that arose during the course of their 25, 26 year old relationship and friendship, which was informed by the most profound mutual respect. And the kind of respect that they had for each other, I would like to illustrate that by just two quotations. At the end of December 1945, uh, Rabindranath was already four years dead. He died in August 1941. An answer to a query, Gandhi was visiting Shantideketan at the end of 1945. And in answer to a query, uh, Gandhi said, had the following thing to say. He wrote, he said rather, quote, I have found no real conflict between Rabindranath and myself. I started with a disposition to detect a conflict between Gurudev and myself, but ended with the glorious discovery that there was none." Unquote. So the initial assumption was that there would be differences because one was a poet and the other was an experiment, in his own words, an experiment with truth, uh, largely to, with, to do with the world of politics and mass mobilization. Rabindranath, in his turn, uh, two months before his death, July 1939, uh, in an article written for the Modern Review, had this to say, Though I have the imagination to conceive, I have not the power to carry out. Only a few men in the world have this power. And since our country has had the good fortune of giving birth to such a man, the way should be kept clear for Gandhi's progress. I would never think of impeding it. I would never think of impeding it. I'd like to emphasize that because they, they had differences. There is no point denying the fact that on many issues, Gandhi and Rabindranath had differences. These issues were to do with Charka, uh, whether it had to do in one very remarkable incident about what divine anger could do to human beings or should not do to human beings. This was in reference to the Muzaffarpur earthquake of 1934, where they differed very sharply. And also to do about the imposition of discipline. This was the most long lasting difference that they had. Whether difference, whether discipline could be imposed whether unity could be imposed from above, particularly Hindu-Muslim unity and discipline also, could it be imposed from above, which Gandhi occasionally tried to do, as in the 
Khilafat movement, as in in his many experiments in the ashram, in his own ashram. And Rabindranath believed on the contrary that discipline was necessary, absolutely necessary, but that discipline should be organic. It should come from within the individual, from the realization of the inner self of the individual. They argued about these things, they differed about these things, but I have tried to show in this book that these differences are like ripples on, on a river or the surf in the ocean. The subtext of their lives, their activities, their exchanges is a much more profound agreement about the destiny of India, about a vision for India. Both of them used the same word to describe this vision and this destiny. The word was Swaraj. Gandhi wrote about it extensively, particularly what I consider to be the most important text of his life, the Hind Swaraj. He wrote about Swaraj and what Swaraj meant, would mean for India and Indians. And Rabindranath, in his various essays in the late 19th, early 20th century, and in his poems also wrote about Swaraj. The vision was the same, that Swaraj does not mean just political independence from British rule. Swaraj also means the ability of every single individual to regulate their own lives, to live lives that were independent of institutions. Individuals should be autonomous, their life should be self-regulating. Rabindranath expressed this characteristically in a, in a very famous song where he said, we are all kings in the kingdom of our king. Amra Shobai Raja, Amadere Raja Rajate. So if everybody is sovereign Raja, then what is the need of a king or a sovereign? Gandhi said the same thing in a very different phrase when he used the word enlightened anarchy to describe what his vision of Swaraj was. It is because they agreed on this most fundamental proposition regarding Swaraj that they could disagree on the means to get there. They, they walked together in for the end, towards the end. They walked alone occasionally at times so far the means to that end was concerned. So they also had a very fundamental agreement regarding what constituted the history of India. Both Gandhi and Rabindranath believed that the history of India could not be captured through the activities of kings, princes, royalties and what they did whether they would be the British rulers, the Mughal rulers, or whoever, they believe that the history of India was constituted by the daily lives of ordinary human beings. And Rabindranath went so far as to say that that history that captures only the activities of royalties I feel like telling those historians, get off with your history. And Gandhi wrote in the Hind Swaraj that what is recorded in history, the activities of kings, princes, and so on, great men, is, act, is actually not the stuff of history. It is actually an interruption of history. The real history is that how human beings behave, how human beings sustain themselves in their own fashion. And 
it is by strengthening those human beings giving them the confidence the morale to actually run their own lives that lives that is the stuff of history that would constitute and make swaraj gandhi's empathy gandhi's not empathy that's a not strong enough word to use gandhi's complete identification with the poor of india the simple common people of india is well known in his first trial in india in 1923 in ahmedabad when he was asked by the court what is your occupation standard court protocol your name mohandas karamchand gandhi your occupation gandhi stunned the judge stunned the entire court with his reply he said farmer and weaver he didn't say he was the undisputed leader of the congress party he didn't say he was the qualified barrister at law he said farmer and weaver he completely identified himself with the commonest indian and he did that not just in speech he did that also in the way he presented himself to the public the tonsured head the bare body the loin cloth according around his waist shaft in hand the image that we have of the mahatma was a very deliberately cultivated image an image that reinforced this identity with the common man so both of them in gandhi's identification is very well known rabindranath has nehru described in the aristocrat poet is a little less known his identification but just to just. make the point that he also identified in his own poetical way and poetical fission with the common people of india i will just just quote a couple of lines from a poem in the collection of poems called noibeddo sacred offering poem number 99 rabindranath writes there give me the strength never to disown the poor give me the strength never to disown the poor or bend my knees before the insolent might bend my knees before the insolent might he is praying for that strength to stand next to the poor to stand against the insolence of the mighty gandhi did the same right through his life nobody could make him yield to something that he did not believe in neither did rabindra so despite their differences the occasions when they had to walk alone they actually walked together and the walking together is best exemplified in the way that they disagreed they disagreed often but they disagreed without any rancor without any acrimony their disagreements were always imbued with mutual respect they they thus set for us a tradition of public argument and public discussion where we can following their examples disagree with each other without abusing each other we can disagree with respect this is one of the legacies of the gandhi rabindranath relationship that i emphasize in my book i think i have spoken enough thank you thank you rudrangshu and now we go on to our next panelist of this evening and that is somebody very close to gandhi sri tushar gandhi the great grandson of kasturba and mohandas gandhi grandson of their second son malilal and daughter-in-law shushila 
and son of Sunanda and Arun Gandhi. In 1996, Tushar Gandhi discovered an urn containing the ashes from Gandhi's funeral pyre forgotten in the strong room of the State Bank of India's Katak branch. He secured permission from the Supreme Court and immersed them in the Triveni Sangam on 30th January 1997. The same year he founded the Mahatma Gandhi Foundation, of which he is currently the founder president. Tushar Gandhi is the president of Lok, Sava, Lok Seva Trust and director of the Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon. In 2005, he commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Dandi Coach by organizing re-enactment of the 241 mile long walk. He walked the entire stretch and was instrumental in getting the prime minister to declare the route from Sabarmati Ashram to Dandi, India's historic heritage route. I invite Tushar Gandhi to tell us a bit about Gandhi and also his own perceptions of his great grandfather in terms of a personal anecdote, because he uh, probably has those stories which none of us know. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Das Gupta. I'm very grateful that uh, I've been included on this illustrious panel to discuss uh, this book. Thank you for a very uh, kind and generous introduction also. Uh, much of it I have to, I just inherited. <laughs> I have to still achieve. But I guess uh, the inheritance is my identity and I can't escape uh, that. I don't wish to escape it either. Uh, people do think that, uh, you know, how dare he say that, but that's my life. I'm the descendant and I don't wish to be known as anything else uh, at all. But for me, rather than, uh, you know, when I was invited to speak at this function, I was I questioned myself, I said, am I qualified to talk about uh, Bapu and uh, Gurudev, you know, such illustrious, titanic uh, people, and uh, how am I qualified to talk about it, except for my birth connection with uh, Bapu. But what I would like, what I felt on reading the book was that this book is so contemporarily important. This book to me, this book talked about current India more than it talked about the history of these two titanic people because it told me about the common vision that these two had for India and how we are straying from that. And uh, to me, the importance of this book is that it is it, it is like a beacon that shows us to come back onto the path of these two great people and the vision they had seen for present day India. And so I, I felt that I should uh, mention that because I think for the current generation of Indians, that message of these two titans is much, much more important than uh, the personalities of the two people and their common uh, heritage. It's very amusing when you read this book you start discovering the commonalities and the opposites of uh, uh, both of them. And yet throughout it, you see the strain of mutual respect and trust for each other. And the respect and trust is so deep that it does not even hinder their complete disagreements with each other on many issues. And it's almost as if, uh, the relationship thrives on those disagreements. It, it it sort of becomes with every disagreement, it becomes more healthy, more close, more uh, understanding of each other, which is very unique in today's times, uh, where relationships break at the snap of a finger. And uh, 
So I, I thought that this book talked on many planes to the reader. One was a historical uh, record of the two people, their legacies, their visions. The other was a very deep analysis of the relationship of the two people and their times. The commonalities and the opposites of the two people and how the two of them were sort of like uh, governing each other's impulsiveness. You know, uh, 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 Rabindranath uh, or, or Gurudev being the elder, and I, I feel like as if they were siblings, both of them. And uh, Gurudev was playing the role of the elder brother, continuously watching the younger guy and thinking, oh my God, what is he going to do next? Um, you know, mm -hmm. I need to stabilize him kind of thing. And yet, post Jadiyawala Bhak, Gurudev wants to do the impulsive thing about defying the British and going to Amritsar uh, and quoting arrest as protest. And Bapu says, hold it, hold it. We don't want to rush into things. We need to find out everything. We don't know everything about the situation. Let's first study the whole situation and then go in and do something. So the roles are reversed uh, on many occasions. On many uh, times, Gurudev is preaching caution to Bapu and saying, don't go off the reservation so much. I know you love to go off the reservation from time to time, but don't wander off so much. You know, we uh, need to be, uh, our objective is that, and we need to walk a uh, journey towards it. And so both sort of keep changing roles in their relationship with each other. And every change of that role is accepted by them. If it is the first visit of Bapu to Shanti Niketan, I'm sure what he tried to do over there of trying to get them to do their own work and getting rid of the upper caste books and all that and talking about the filth in the kitchen and all that must have been very revolutionary for that institution at that time where everybody just took it for granted and were not bothered about any of it with no uh, you know, consideration of its consequences. And then here a visitor who comes in who's ostensibly looking for shelter for his people and coming and telling them your home is, needs to be set right. You know, if I was to walk into somebody's house and uh, start giving them instructions, the door will be slammed on my face immediately. And yet, uh, Bapu must have felt something that he could speak this in the kind of welcome and acceptance that he saw in Shantini And that emboldened him to say that. And Gurudev and his people also accepted that no, so, He's making sense. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it's unacceptable, but he's making sense. Let's try it out at least. And this is what where the relationship really becomes very important to understand because from matters of the kitchen, it goes into matters of the nation, the people, and of the future also because what they are doing in their present is going to have an effect on the future of a country which will be born and even there at that time although gurudev is not present physically his influence is still there and these two great people you know uh, 70 plus years later one can't ignore them this book compels people to pick it up and read and find out why these two people are still important I don't think any of the present generation leaders will be of any significance seven decades after them. Those uh, who are today being talked about as larger than life and we see such adulation and devotion and things, it's not going to last the way these two icons and so many of the, that time keep mattering to us. And that is where I think this book becomes uh, very, very important. And I think what uh, the, the influence that Gurudev had on Bapu 
was that when I was a child uh, growing up with my grandmother, uh, I used to impulsively react uh, to, to things and, uh, you know, do something which later on I would regret. And my grandmother put that habit into me saying, you know, many a times you'll be in a situation when you want to instantly respond to something, instantly react to something. But say, she said, remember one thing. When you do that, you may do something that you will end up regretting. So take a breath before responding. And that will give you the pause to, that is required to think of the better response to that uh, uh, incident. And as I grew up, you know, initially I used to always wonder, you know, when I want to punch somebody in the nose, what's the use of waiting for a minute before punching that person in the nose? I'd rather do it and get over with it. But as I grew up, I understood the importance of that why I was being told to pause. Because when I started cultivating the maturity of pausing, I, re I realized that nine out of the ten times i would realize that the punch was not the real response that was required and i think on many occasions gurudev performed that role for Bapu also that when he wanted to go out punching gurudev said just hold on just hold on i'm not saying you're doing wrong but just hold on and when Gurudev said, no, you are doing wrong. Papu said, just hold on. You know, let me do it. The, the Dandi Kuch was an example when everybody was saying that you're doing the wrong thing and you're going to end up like being a laughing star. He said, just hold on. Let me do it. And I don't mind if I become a laughing star. Because I know that failure is not the end. And if you read Gurudev and in this book, the extracts of his writing, every other message says that failure is not the end. There is life beyond failure. There is success beyond failure. And I think that mentorship that Bapu got was very important. And so I feel that this book is really very important for present day India, where it shows us the danger that we are in, in in the present today of destroying the dream of our founders and not just in political terms but in social terms the fabric of society the understanding of nationhood the understanding of patriotism the understanding of matru bhumi that they, uh, he gives us, both of them give us through their own interpretation of that term. I, I believe that that is the importance of this book. And that's why, you know, I, I, I would love to thank uh, Professor Mukherjee to, uh, for this uh, a very important book, not just about two iconic people, but about their dream for India and the nightmare that we are turning it in. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Tushar Gandhi. And now we will go to our next speaker <coughs> of this panel, Dr. Ravindra Kumar. Dr. Ravindra Kumar is a political scientist. He is a peace educator, an Indologist, a humanist, cultural anthropologist, Gandhian thinker, and a former vice chancellor of CCS University, Neerat. Currently, he's an ombudsman of Swami Vivekananda Subharti University, Meerut, and the editor in chief of Global Peace International Journal. He has written more than 100 books and 400 articles on greatest personalities of the Indian subcontinent, especially Gautam Buddha, Swami Vivekananda, Mahatma Gandhi, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, 
and on various social, political, educational, cultural, and academic issues to his credit. He has authored and edited more than 100 works on great personalities of the Indian subcontinent, including Mahatma Gandhi, and on various social, religious, political, historical, educational, and cultural issues. Some of his works, of which many are of international repute and have been translated into Marathi, Tamil, and Thai languages, <coughs> apart from Hindi and English language, include morality and ethics in public life, religion and world peace, Gandhi and Gandhism, part first, champion to quit India movement, theory and practice of Gandhian nonviolence, nonviolence and its philosophy, 5,000 years of Indian culture towards peace, Mahatma Gandhi at the close of the 20th century, Gandhian thoughts and overview, and Mahatma Gandhi in the beginning of the 21st century. I invite Dr. Ravindra Kumar to tell us a, a bit about his responses to Tagore and Gandhi walking alone, walking together. I am grateful to India International Center for inviting me to a discussion on a very timely work, Tagore and Gandhi, Walking Alone, Walking Together, by Professor Rudranshu Mukherjee. Divided into six chapters, this work by Professor Mukherjee reveals, of course, the Indian religious and philosophical tradition to be the foundation of the ideas of the both Gurudev Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi. In other words, it brings to the fore eventually the truth of thoughts of the both to be based on Indian religious and philosophical tradition. Professor Mukherjee, though, talks about the development of Tagore's deep interest in the Indian religious and philosophical tradition, so about Gandhiji, and mentions in this context the family environment of the both, and it is the reality. But stepping forward in this regard, I straightforwardly talk about Tagore's ideas being based on his firm faith and conviction. Shraddha or Dred Vishwas in Indian religious and philosophical tradition, which I realize Professor Mukherjee also accepts eventually. The same thing is with respect to Bapuji, Mahatma Gandhi, whose ideas, Gandhi Vichar, as well as his actions, were based purely on the basic Indian Dharma and philosophical tradition appealing the whole world for the greater welfare of one and all and on this planet the upliftment of the whole of humanity the truth of indivisible whole avibhajya samagrata is the nucleus of the basic indian dharma and philosophy which are complementary to each other in other words these are based on the truth of indivisible totality. All aspects of life are inextricably intervened with one another. They all essentially affect one another continuously. There is no dividing line among them. To quote the Mahatma, Life being an indivisible whole, no line can be drawn between its different compartments, social, political, religious, even economic, as all act and react upon one another. And not between ethics and politics. And you cannot divide social, economic, 
political and purely religious work into water tight compartments. The reality of the truth of universal unity, Sarvabhamik Ekta, is at the core of the Indian Dharma and philosophy. The origin of all of this is from the one and the same source, and the interdependence of living beings is manifested from this. As man is the super creature of the universe, he possesses extraordinary qualities or virtues like intellect and creativity, the realization and embracing of the truth, and act accordingly is expected from man. Active goodwill towards living being and equal treatment with fellow beings is the asset trust of truth. This reality is quite clear from a number of articles, statements, and speeches of Mahatma Gandhi, which also manifests itself in his actions and struggles. The same aspect emerges predominantly in the worthy creation and thoughts of Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore. Approaches of the both had a universal appeal. Sarvabhami or Brihad Kalyankari, Trishtikon. Despite having ideological differences and the way of working, life of the both of them were dedicated to the search of truth. Therefore, it is quite appropriate to say that the both Gurudev and Mahatmaji had the same goal while working along. As such, on the other hand, they were in a way walking together also. This work of Professor Mukherjee is very important from this viewpoint. A lot could be learned from this work and it will prove to be a source of inspiration for many others in future. I thanks Professor Mukherjee for this work and also congratulate him from the core of my heart. Secondly, Tagore's thoughts about Indian society and evolutionary culture and the influences of Yuga Purush, man of the era. On both of these, his approach to the basic spirit of history and the glimpse of his ideas related to the search of civilization come to the fore in this book. Especially Guru Deva's critical analysis in relation to the influence of Yuga Purush, man of the eras, on society and culture is a sign of the sincerity of the learned author, Professor Mukherjee. Really very rare like this. A brief analysis of Gandhiji's works, his struggle for equality of fellow beings in South Africa and India, with which the aspect of human liberty, justice and right were also associated is welcome and worth considering. Ideas related to Swadeshi and Swaraj, from Antyode to Sarvode, and actions accordingly are well mentioned. And from this viewpoint too, this timely and important work is welcome. Professor Mukherjee's efforts are commendable for he deserves congratulation once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ravindra Kumar. And now let us see whether we have some questions from the audience. I do not see any right now. So would would the panelists be interested in uh, asking a few questions to each other? Do you think that you have a particular question to ask the author, especially? Uh, Dr. Ravindra Kumar, uh, Sri Tushar Gandhi, do you have any questions for Rudrangshu? And as Rudrangshu uh, mentioned, that we have been friends for, I don't know, 50 years, though we hardly meet. But T.S. Eliot, Rudrangshu, remember, said that meeting is for strangers. <laughs> so, no, 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 thank you. It's okay. <laughs> so, if uh, if there are 
apparently there are no questions. Uh, it has been such an Im impressive session that the audience is really thinking. They, have, they are spellbound and I'm sure they will uh, acquire a copy of the book when next time they find themselves in bookshops if they physically go there, but otherwise there is Amazon. Um, yeah. I, yes. I, I request and hope uh, Professor Mukherjee to please um, bring many more such works because it is really that Tushar was also actually um, hinting or mentioning that um, it is the need of the hour for our uh, present and generations to come. So please, as much as you can possible, please do this. So, yes, he has a book on Nehru and Bose, and he has another one coming up on Lakshmi Bai. And uh, what's the name of the other person? I'm uh, not Hazrat, Hazrat Mahal and Lakshmi Bai. The book is actually out already. Okay. Oh, I'm looking forward to reading that one. Good. Uh, because my uh, interest is gender, as you probably know. Through time, I've evolved a little, I think. So, penguin penguin has brought it out so it's already out very good congratulations for that book in fact uh, one of my students had done a phd on 1857 fact fiction and film but at that time your books were not available i was wanted to scold her then till i saw the uh, dates of publication because she finished i think in 2014. oh no shongita many of my books had come out before that the 1857 yeah. book yeah, my first book on 1857 is dated 1984. Okay, I'm going to send her a little caustic note now. <laughs> All right. So, any, if we do not have any further questions, and since it's six o'clock, but we can uh, go on for a few minutes, according to Usha, I will just say that the authors. Uh, pointed out very important sections that the book tried to ex explore and also once again foregrounded Hind Swaraj, a book that we do not read as often as we should. And so, and you know, also I'm sure Rudrangshu has stated that Irma Gandhi was also a brilliant writer. His handling of English prose was very, very impressive. And so was his two friends, Nehru and, of course, Tagore, of course, stands alone. But also the fact that Rudangshu pointed out, it is uh, in terms of being an historian, he emphasized that uh, Gandhi and Tagore, both of them believed that it is not only the history of a nation is not the history of kings. It is a history of the poor people, almost anticipating Edward Said and the unofficial histories. And so it's really, uh, we learned a lot from Rudrangshu's presentation, but I think uh, we need to read the book carefully in order to see how the book speaks to us right now. There is, and so I have a message that we need to wrap up now and let's see if there is there a clear difference in the economic view of Gandhiji and Rabindranath can any uh, one answer that question before we wrap up there actually isn't very a great deal of difference if I might say so because both of them believed that the new India the India that would be informed by Swaraj would have to begin at the reconstruction of village life. Hmm. Which again we see. I think uh, Ram Swaraj was the cornerstone, whatever, whichever terms uh, either used for it. It was basically it meant uh, the economic independence of every village. And I think that was the basis of their economic uh, regeneration theory. So it was very, very similar to each other. It, it doesn't seem to be at all divergent. Maybe the tools of that uh, resurgence might have been different if both of them had implemented their own models, but uh, the objective again would have been the same. So again, you know, walking yeah. together, walking alone would have been manifested in that also. And since 
been asked to wrap this up. Let's say that uh, Tushar Gandhi has emphasized on, on respect and trust, and also the fact that one has to introspect, one has to uh, not be impulsive. That is how Gandhi and um, and Tagore were constantly counseling each other. And of course, uh, Ravindra Kumar has told us about faith, religion, and dharma being motivating forces in terms of the interaction between Gandhi and Tagore. So we are looking forward to reading the book carefully. This is a book which needs a lot of concentrated reading, and I'm sure the audience will be very happy to collect their own copies of the book. Thank you so much, all the panelists, Rudrang Shur, and Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Tushar. Thank, Thank you, you Ra Professor you. Kumar. Thank you, Songjita. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you IIC and uh, Rupa and everybody.